The Chancellor, Philip Hammond, will make clear in his Mansion House speech tonight that the government will stick to its promise to reduce the nation's debts. It's why he's also making it clear that the £20 billion promised to the NHS in England will have to come from tax rises. It's been the Conservative government's mission since they were elected in coalition at the height of the financial crisis in 2010 to get the public finances under control. This week, it's exactly eight years since George Osborne's emergency budget that set out the spending cuts and tax rises that led to austerity. This year, he tweeted, We got there in the end. A remarkable national effort. And David Cameron replied, It was the right thing to do. Over the next 40 minutes of our special programme on austerity, we'll be examining what the effect of it has been. Stephanie Flanders was the BBC's economics editor at the time. She now works for Bloomberg and she's been reflecting on the age of austerity. It was all about the AAA back in the summer of 2010. In opposition, George Osborne has said that was his first benchmark for policy to safeguard Britain's top AAA credit rating, the private rating that told global investors the British government was a safe bet. International lenders were turning on Greece, sending its economy into a tailspin The UK actually had a bigger hole in its public finances than Greece did relative to the size of the economy. We had to act now, Mr Osborne said, or we risk being next on the list. Greece is a reminder of what happens when governments lack the willingness to act decisively and quickly and when problems are swept under the carpet. It all seems a long time ago now. We lost the AAA rating anyway in 2013. It turned out investors didn't really care. We should remember that Labour announced its own austerity plans in the spring, but we knew that George Osborne would want to cut deeper when he became Chancellor after the May election. What hadn't been discussed in a long but incredibly detail-free election campaign was how. That we found out in the emergency budget on the 22nd of June. On the 4th of January next year, the main rate of VAT will rise from 17.5% to 20%. The years of debt and spending make this unavoidable. This single tax... The plan then was to plug the gap between non-investment spending and revenues, the current deficit, in just five years. In the end, it will have taken nearly ten. That highlights the irony lurking in Britain's experience of austerity since 2010. You could say there was too much austerity and too little. It was tricky to explain back then. And it still is. At home and abroad, Mr Osborne was happy to be the standard bearer for budget cuts and hanging tough. But if you compare our deficit cuts to those of our neighbours, we don't look very austere at all. Our deficit not only started larger, it stayed larger. In fact, the gap between tax revenues and spending in the UK was nearly twice as large as the average for the Eurozone economies in every year that George Osborne ran the Treasury. How could this be amid all that tough rhetoric Well, because the strong export-led recovery built into that 2010 budget never happened. Instead, we had slow growth at home and the Eurozone crisis across the channel, meaning borrowing stayed high despite Mr Osborne's efforts. In the face of this disappointment, the Chancellor did what crisis economies like Portugal and Greece weren't allowed to do. He ripped up his target. He had said borrowing would fall to 1% of GDP by 2015. It's still higher than that now. So there was much less austerity than the government's own plans and rhetoric had suggested. But for local government, the squeeze was real. Core budgets were cut by 30% in real terms between 2010 and 2015, and they haven't risen since. The British government was borrowing one of every four pounds it spent in 2009. That's not something you can do for very long. We'll never know whether another Chancellor's version of austerity would have given us an easier ride. We do know that the pattern of spending cuts had consequences for cities and towns across the country, which may live with us for a long time to come. Well, as Stephanie Flanders explained there, the past eight years of austerity have hit local government budgets particularly hard. Andrew Bomford has been to the Derbyshire Peak District to examine how the community there has been affected by cuts to local services. I'm cycling in the beautiful Derbyshire Dales with Matthew Paris former MP and Times columnist, close to his home of the last 35 years, trying to avoid the potholes. Bit of one there. Yeah, really bad in uh, bad light at uh, twilight or after dark. 
Despite a flurry of pothole filling in the area lately, plenty still remain. Oh, that's a bit of a crater. Yeah, you wouldn't want to hit that one, would you? Well, I did. One just like it. Broke a few ribs. I came round a corner, going downhill, didn't see a pothole in that position. It was deeper than that. Came off, well, quite badly grazed and broke a few ribs, but I was fine. Uh, you know, I'm always breaking ribs. That doesn't matter. But I, I was lucky. I was wearing a helmet and the helmet was stove in on one side. Wow, that shows after what my, it would have done uh, After to my head. head hit the uh, asphalt, so yes. Maybe it was that knock on the head, but it got him thinking. What do potholes tell you about government austerity? They're what uh, frayed collar or cuffs or down at heel shoes where the uh, the heels worn right down or there's a hole in the sole say about individuals that they're struggling and that they're having to make candle end economies if potholes are appearing and are not being filled in it's an early sign that uh, a local authority has simply run out of money and you have to ask what other perhaps even more important things that they're be beginning to have to compromise on and it's one of those things that people start to notice. It's surprising, isn't it, what a relatively minor issue like potholes does to people's sense of what's happening in their community. Don't ever say that potholes are a relatively minor issue, at least not in my newspaper. I write for The Times. <laughs> Nothing has got my readers going more than the, the issue of, of potholes. It really matters. Everybody has a a son, a husband, a, a wife who's just lost a wheel or an axle or been grounded waiting for the AA for, for uh, four hours or, or whatever. Uh, people get very, very angry about these things. It's the equivalent of a broken window on an urban street. A pothole is a thing comfortable middle-class voters notice even when they're immune to the impact of spending cuts, which recent research shows have hit the poorest hardest. Gosh, you're on the ball today. Yes. Hey, Good I morning. wasn't expecting you to half past. People like Dorothy Hughes, who's not mobile enough to catch a regular bus, even if there were any near her rural home. Where are you off to today? Buxton. Is, it, is this your weekly shop? If I didn't have that, I wouldn't get out all week. Dorothy's been collected in a bus run by Bakewell and Eam Community Transport. It's a charity which used to be funded by the council until the last round of spending cuts ended their £172,000 grant last year. It's meant that pensioners like Dorothy have to pay more. When it went from £3 to £5, to me that was an acceptable rise. But when it went to £8, just not long afterwards, I felt that that was a little bit too much, and it was because of that that we had less people coming on the bus because they just couldn't afford to. It takes a bit to do with Edwina Edwards runs the community bus service. Well, it's devastating with the cutbacks right the way across the public sector. You're talking of three or four changes to a bus to get to an essential service like a hospital, a shopping centre, so they're having to travel more. So it's just a knock-on effect all the way around. In Chesterfield, a group of carers have been invited out for afternoon tea by the Derbyshire Carers Association. It's a rare chance to get a break out of the house for people like Pat Morley. I don't class it as a job. That's what I was brought up to do. I looked after my aunt and I looked after my mum and now I'm looking after my dad. Pat's 97-year-old father, a former Spitfire pilot, goes to a council-funded lunch club, which was recently threatened with closure until local people won a reprieve. She became ill recently and found it hard to cope, without support from the Carers' Association. I know they have to make cuts, and I appreciate that, but I think there are a lot more older people now in the community. We're getting older ourselves, and maybe one of us won't be around to look after him. So I think it's a bit short-sighted. Narinda Sharma, chief executive of Derbyshire Carers Association, thinks austerity is damaging what could be a great opportunity to find better solutions to huge challenges like social care for the elderly. At the moment, the NHS and adult social care 
is focused upon trying to move towards a preventative agenda, and that is a great aspiration that they should be attempting to do so. But that shift requires considerable and massive investment and can't be done at a time of austerity, as we've seen. So from a strategic point of view, it makes no sense asking community organizations to pick up more slack. And yet those community organizations at the same time, their funding is being reduced because of austerity. Like all councils, Derbyshire County Council has had its funding heavily cut by central government, with a loss of more than £250 million since 2010, and with more cuts to come. Its leader, Barry Lewis, says it's all about partnering with local communities. In other words, getting them to do it instead. What we're trying to do, I think, by being inventive, by trying to seek solutions rather than giving the bad news constantly, is to work to find a solution. And I think that's what we have to do, as I say, is in co-production with our uh, communities and, uh, and so on. It's not going to be easy. Part of what we're suggesting, for example, about our libraries is talking to community groups about how they can provide um, a service in some of those smaller libraries in Derbyshire. It's got to the point where we have to look at those kind of um, solutions. But by doing that, we hope we can ameliorate some of those um, impacts on those that are most vulnerable and need those services the most. It's become accepted wisdom that people, local communities, will always step in. But there's a limit. In Derbyshire, many of those who think austerity has been necessary now seem to be saying, enough. Andrew Bomford there. Well, I'm joined in the studio um, and will be throughout the programme by Rupert Harrison, who was Special Advisor to George Osborne when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. He now works uh, for the financial company BlackRock and by Anoush Shekelian, who's from the New Statesman. Good afternoon to you both. Uh, Rupert Harrison, you will remember, you were in the room at the time uh, that these were decisions were taken. And a lot of people said then, and I've said since, that this was ideological, that actually austerity was a good excuse to shrink the size of the state. Was there an element of that? No, I, absolutely not. Uh, but I think it's very important to split what we call austerity into two very different kinds of decisions. There was the first one, which is the one that Stephanie was talking mainly about, was a, a big economic decision for the country of dealing with what was an unsustainable deficit at a very perilous time for the UK economy, a deficit of 10% of GDP, no majority in the House of Commons, a very vulnerable banking system, the Greek crisis erupting, and the need to deal with that deficit and bring it down. And I think that that is increasingly seen as a... a a decision that was necessary, uh, that worked. Uh, the the deficit is effect. down. The envelope of exactly. the Exactly. And, and, and the UK you know, grew over that period, the joint fastest in the G7. Employment reached a record high. I think that kind of economic record uh, relative to other countries is good. There was, of course, a, a separate part of the decision, which was to do the bulk of that by reducing spending rather than increasing taxes. So about 80% of it was done with lower spending, 20% with higher taxes. I think that was on balance until now, we can go on to talk about that, the right balance, because actually what happened was that spending grew very high as a percentage of GDP and is now that close. And that was a sort of ideological thing. Well, I think thing, that if you had had, you know, uh, Stephanie ended her piece saying, well, could it have been different? You know, I think if you'd had a Labour government in place, they would have done much more with tax and much more with spending. Uh, and so we can debate that, you know, the result of that, we, we, we already now have a tax burden as a share of the economy that's near historic highs. That would be even higher and that would have consequences for incomes and growth. Uh, but of course, that would have been more money spent on public services. Anoush Shekeli, and, and you take issue with that 80-20, so 80% cuts on spending and 20% in tax increases. I do. I do subscribe to the view that it was an ideological choice to try and fix the economy in this way back then. Um, it was a political choice rather than economic necessity. I mean, look at the cost of um, making all of those spending cuts. OK, you managed to um, get rid of the deficit, but but at what cost? The country isn't working. I've been doing um, a series of reports around the country looking at the services that you mentioned earlier um, on the programme, potholes, library closures, um, social care, cuts to care homes. And and it just, you know, the government isn't paying to keep the country functioning anymore. So what's the point of a government if it's not doing that? Well, I think, again, you have to look at the, the counterfactual and the situation we found ourselves in. You know, the sad truth was in 2010, we found ourselves in a country that was a lot poorer than anyone had expected it would be. And you have two choices there. You can either cut spending to fit your new level of income, or you can increase tax to fill that gap. And that would have meant low, lower incomes for, for families. It, I believe it would have meant lower economic growth. Just, what was it like in being in the room? Because actually, I mean, with, it, was, it happened two years later, the deficit was cut. At the time, 
What was the feeling? Because it was obviously it was a fe- new chancellor. You were advising him. It felt like a, a huge burden of responsibility. I mean, it really, if it's, you have to think back to 2010, it felt like a moment of national peril. You know, we had had, uh, we, we, the UK looked like a basket case internationally. We had the biggest deficit in the G20. We had this enormous banking system that was still very fragile. And then we had an election that delivered a hung parliament for the first time in a generation. And people were, you know, I remember going into the Treasury, uh, talking to Mervyn King and others at the Bank of England, you know, people whose lives have been spent in economic policy. Yeah, and they were very nervous it was a dangerous period for the UK. We are, we'll come back to you both and pick up from there uh, in a, j- just a little bit later in the programme. Also later in the programme, we're going to be hearing about the impact of welfare reforms aimed at getting people back into work. The big culture shock was when I went for a medical and was told I was fit for work and I didn't expect that. Well, do get in touch with us on social media about austerity or indeed anything else. Hashtag BBC Watto, our email address, world at one at bbc.co.uk. Well, this morning, uh, before we came on air, I spoke to the Shadow Chancellor, John MacDonald, about the age of austerity. And he told me how he thinks the policies put in place eight years ago have changed Britain. I think all those things that we took for granted as the basic fabric of our society has been shaken and, in some instances, not just undermined, but completely withdrawn. And it's a worrying sense of what's been lost. There's example after example, but the NHS always comes to the fore when it comes to the impact of austerity because we care about the sick, obviously. But sometimes a picture sums it all up. And if you remember the year before last, that picture of the child being treated in an A&E with two plastic chairs put together, we thought, this is not the society that we thought we lived in, whether it's the NHS, whether it's you know, Theresa May's own constituency, pupil having to bring in toilet rolls from their parents, that sort of thing. All of those basic elements of the fabric of our society that we once held dear... Now we feel they're either gone, like my Sure Start centres closed, or are under threat. That's, I think, why people have just had enough. Well, that raises a very interesting question. Would you be Shadow Chancellor? Would Jeremy Corbyn be leader of the Labour Party if it weren't for austerity? I don't think so. I think what's happened is that people, from the banking crash, first of all, saw the economic system does not work. But then there was a small sort of quietude that took place. The Conservatives then get elected, and instead of bringing forward a solution, they bring forward austerity, which people then become exhausted of. And as a result of that, they're looking for change, and that change they look to us. So your political raison d'etre is to address austerity, which is why it is so interesting to look at what you have put forward to address it. I mean, some of the things you point to, but also welfare, where the welfare budget uh, has uh, taken basically a, a third, more than a third, of the reduction in spending. And yet, of the cuts yet to come, you would reverse only a relatively small fraction of them, two billion of the nine billion. See, what we're offering is a transformation of the system itself. When it comes to welfare, actually, let's take it step by step. One of the issues is that it is about people's low incomes. That's why we said £10 an hour living wage. The reason people's incomes are so low is because whereas 20 years ago, 80% of us, our wages were determined by collective bargaining, no longer determined in that way. It's only 20% as a result of the undermining of trade union rights. So the reform of trade union rights in this country to ensure people have a representative voice and the restoration of collective bargaining immediately will result in a lift in people's wages. That then takes people off welfare. But then, of course, you then have to reform welfare. And we put enough money in the budget to start those reforms. Two billion. But, yes, but that you was... Two, in fact, what you've done is your pledge is purely in the manifesto to hold a review of cuts and how best to reverse them. But you've only set aside two billion to do that. Because the structural transformation of our economy will result in a transformation of how we see welfare as well, which means lifting people out of welfare by decent wages, decent conditions, proper representation at work. We've got to move away saying the welfare system will solve everything. It won't. What will change is how we manage our economy.
economy and who owns our economy. So that's the debate we're having, right. not just in the Labour Party, but wider society. Which means what? What is your ideal right. for government spending as a percentage of national income? It's 41% at the moment or thereabouts. Where would you ideally have it? As high as France at 56%? No, no. If you look at our plans, it will be around about that 41, 42% level. As it is now. Because what you do is you use the state to actually stimulate the growth of the economy. And when you grow that economy, you then grow the level of prosperity within society. And this is the difference between us and the Tories always will be, is that prosperity will be shared by everybody. What seems extraordinary is that you set out... What damage austerity has done to Britain? And yet you end up in a position where you say your Labour government would not be spending any more of national income and you would only be hitting people with tax who earn more than 80,000. We 80, believe, we believe if we have a fair taxation system, we invest in our public services... We invest in our economy, particularly the infrastructure. We can grow the economy to have a, an economy that's prosperous economically, but also environmentally sustainable, and where we share that prosperity with everyone. In that way, we can create the fair society that Labour's already mm. stood up for. The Shadow Chancellor John MacDonald talking to me uh, before we came on air. Well, here with me in the studio now is the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Liz Truss. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Are we still in an age of austerity? We are in an age of reasonable public spending. We've brought the deficit down. And I think it's wrong to say we were in a period of austerity. The, the reality is that under the previous Labour government, we ended up with all of, almost half of national income being spent by the state. We were in an era of profligacy. And what we have done is brought the economy into balance. OK, so are you saying making that there sure... wasn't an age of austerity? I'm saying there's an age where we've reduced the deficit, but to say... That was the phrase that was used by the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. Well, I don't think that is the case. I think we were in an age where we were getting public spending back to what was a reasonable level compared to the size of our economy. So the scale of so cuts we currently, we've seen, Sarah, the scale of cuts we've seen, you do not consider austere? I consider them to be bringing our spending back into line with what we are raising in terms of taxation. But, but the effects of them, the effects of those cuts, have they not, would you not describe them as austere? And Well, what we've done, Sarah, for let's take welfare, which John McDonnell was talking about. We've reformed welfare to make it easier for people to get into work, to make sure that work always pays. The result of that is we've got a record number of people in work. We've got those on the lowest yeah, incomes asking, have I'm seen the highest wide... Question. I'm asking you... But it's you, the, the same question the Prime because... Minister, your Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, David Cameron, the Conservative Prime Minister, used the phrase, we're in an mm. age of austerity. We are now in a situation when you look at the changes to budgets um, on and whether it's local councils, whether it's prisons, whether it's uh, DEFRA, across the piece there are huge cuts that have been made to look. We're hearing about potholes and bus there are services. Different, there are different issues in different areas. But if you look at the fact we are currently spending £29,000 for every household on public services. In terms of education, we're spending more per student than Germany does or Japan does. Is it too On high? health... Is it too high? Would you like to get it lower? No, I don't think. I think we are doing a good job of having a balanced approach. And at the same time, we've reduced the deficit. And we've also reformed the way we spend money. So we're spending more money on capital, on investing in our infrastructure, and we're spending less money on paying people to be out of work. Instead, we're paying them to help them get into work. So there's, it's not just about how much money you spend, it's about how you spend it and making sure that it's encouraging Indeed, but the even kind the of society of, we all want to live in. Even the likes of your colleague Michael Gove have made comments about people having had enough. Do you think that's not the case, that people haven't necessarily had enough of austerity, that there isn't a political requirement to change things? What I think is that people want to see, rightly, the economy grow. grow. They want to see their wages rise. We've been through a very difficult period after the financial crash. Uh, wages haven't risen as much as people would have liked. And that's why we need to boost the economy in all kinds of ways, improve our productivity. But that is not the same as saying that people want a vastly increased state. Uh, I thought it was ironic that John McDonnell was claiming he wants a state of 41% when he's talking about an extra half trillion of debt. 
I think that, you know, we need to make adjustments. So we've just given a big settlement to the NHS. Indeed, where there is, where there is the rising... The tonight is going to say there will need to be tax rises for. So your own Chancellor accepts that the size of the state needs to increase. What he is saying is we need to balance our books, but that is not the same as saying the size of the state needs to increase. I mean, we have reduced the well, size so of the other, state. So other departments will have to take a cut in order to fund that? We need to keep public spending restrained. We absolutely do. We can't have a free-for-all now, that's, that's clear. And we need to reinvent the way government works. So, for example, in the Department of Education, we were able to move £1.3 billion which was spent on central services, we were able to put that to the front line within the education budget so there's more money on the front line for teachers, for uh, schools. Sorry, and that is the approach. Interrupting, but it, just, it seems to you that you're taking a very different line from your own Chancellor, who's talking about tax rises to fund the £20 billion that's going to Well, what the Chancellor has said is that he wants to achieve the fiscal rules that we've set out, which is bringing debt down as a share of GDP, making sure that we bring the deficit below... Two percent, and that the so where's the, the change billion for the NHS? The coming changes from in your that we've book? made in health are going to come from a combination of sources. They will come from areas like tax. They're going to come from so there will be tax sure, rises. Well, we're going to look at it over the next period of time. So the but state the, will the size of the state will increase. Tax rises or the level of tax is different from the size of the state. The size of the state is affected by how much public spending is. What happened under the Labour government is they were spending money they are that they weren't though. raising in tax. They are connected. So perhaps if you finish, because you were saying they will come from tax rises, as I understood you to be saying, this the £20 billion for the NHS, it will come from tax and... It will come from looking at our overall budget. Now, clearly the best way that we are going to raise more tax revenues is to turbocharge growth. We're seeing a record new number of new companies starting. We're seeing a lot of investment in technology, much more, in fact, than other European countries. So money will come from... £20 million. Pounds. And the more growth we get, and we've just had some very good deficit figures in today, better than the OBR forecasts, the less money we will need to raise from either tax or from... Mm. Making making changes in can, other government departments. Can but I quote you? Th there's quite a simple equation here, Sarah, which is you know it's going to be a combination of how much can we right. get growth up, and the, what what do we do on taxation, and what do we do on other spending? And my effect, job as chief the effect, secretary the effect, is to making sure we get as good value for money from that public spending, so that we can keep taxes as low as possible. And the effect of the changes made by the government over the last eight years, have they meant that we are all in it together? Absolutely. And what so, we've seen... So over... you are absolutely satisfied with where the axe has fallen. And when the likes of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation say the poorest have been hit hardest, you'd say they're wrong. Well, the facts speak for themselves, which is since... 2015, we've seen those on the lowest incomes have their salaries rise fastest by 7% in real terms. We've put in place the national living wage. Now, I'm not saying, Sarah, there are no issues. So, for example, housing, I think, is a major challenge we've got. And we do need to free up the planning system. We do need to build more homes. We do need to make it easier for commercial enterprises to expand their businesses. So there are areas, I think young people in particular are struggling to get on the housing ladder. We need to make housing more affordable. We need to build more houses. I would absolutely acknowledge that's an issue. Liz but Truss. I think in terms of the way taxation has fallen, it's been fair. Liz Truss, thank you very much. Well, when George Osborne embarked on his programme of austerity, it had already been decided that spending on health pensions and international aid would be protected. The welfare budget accounted for more than a third of the £32 billion reduction in public spending, as we were hearing. Our social affairs correspondent, Michael Buchanan, takes a look now at the impact of that decision. Everyone who relies on the welfare system has their own story to tell. This is Jason's tale. I would, I would have rather left it for another decade. So in other words, I've had a hip replacement that was totally unnecessary because they wouldn't... <laughs> it's almost like... We're not giving you the money unless you're showing that you're actually doing something to get back into work. It's that threat that if you don't do something, we're not going to give you any money. Jason Bailey is 50, ex-forces. He has a number of physical disabilities that have prevented him from working for the past seven years. 
He says he brought forward his hip replacement operation by several years to prove to his job centre that he was doing everything in his power to try to find work in case they sanctioned his benefit payment. I survive on a two-week basis because I get paid every two weeks. I get £70 a week. At the end of that two weeks, I'm either got no money or I'm overdrawn. Apart from a lack of money, being dependent on welfare payments means Jason is often... Terrified. <laughs> Literally terrified of them. How bad it is, they, they want to inform on people that are, you know, disabled, that aren't doing, that aren't disabled. Uh, I had an argument with my brother's girlfriend the other day and I actually caught her videoing me helping my dementia mother just doing a bit of gardening and then she threatened me with the video that she'd go to the DWP. I met Jason at Cornwall Neighbourhoods for Change, a social enterprise in Red Ruth. Sitting nearby was Claire Jones, a 41-year-old single mother of three who recently started a job doing admin work for the group. What's it like to be in work? It's amazing. It's so much better. Better for me, it's better for my kids. We're living, we're not just surviving. You okay? I was doing so well. <laughs> Means that much to you? Yeah. Claire's tears are as much of relief as joy. She was unemployed for a number of years and hated every minute of it. When you're on benefits, you have to tick boxes. You know, you seem to be passed from pillar to post. It is just, you're just a number on the system. Having a job does not, of course, mean that someone does not need support from the benefit system. Cornwall is one of England's poorest counties. Low wages mean that tax credits and housing benefit are often needed to boost the incomes of many people, as I heard from Tan Lam, head of Cornwall Neighbourhoods for Change. If you look at Cornwall, 40% of, of the workforce are on under the real living wage. We're, we're keeping a lot of people on very, very minimum wages for a very long time, and that's having a compound impact on their, them struggling to meet their day-to-day -day needs. Those low wages may partly explain why we have record levels of food bank use in this country, as well as record levels of employment. From this storehouse in Camborne near Red Ruth, they currently feed around 500 people a month. Don Gardner was part of the initial team that set up the food bank in 2009 and he's seen how local need has changed. It was emergency food, you know, it was three days food. Uh, we provided it with people that got stuck with the downturn in the economy. Now it's much longer, they're in deeper debt. Their benefits are not meeting their bills. The government deny the reforms force people to food banks, but they've undoubtedly cut benefits. By about 2020 or so, the Institute for Fiscal Studies calculates that spending on benefits will be approximately £32 billion lower than it would have been if the welfare reforms that started in 2010 hadn't been introduced. The Institute for Fiscal Studies says there is some evidence that reducing benefits has contributed to the employment figures. But further, effective welfare reform must be about much more than saving money, says Ed Boyd, a former special advisor at the Department for Work and Pensions. The way that that cost reduction should be structured, and I think was in the past, is around making sure that it incentivizes people to move into work whilst making sure that there's a strong safety net there for people. So, and it's crucial that the government recognise the importance of putting changing lives at the heart of what they do from now till 2020 rather than simply trying to save money. The big culture shock was when I went for a medical and was told I was fit for work and I didn't expect that but I think that gave me then the incentive to say you think I'm fit for work I'm gonna do it then. That's June Jackson who spent 14 years in disability benefits after hurting her leg in a fall. Mentally I'd got myself into a bit of a rut and felt that sort of just being indoors was perfectly normal. June hasn't looked back since that benefit assessment. She now works at Romney Resource Centre in Kent, helping other people into work. A rich, rewarding experience, motivated in part by welfare reform. Michael Buchanan reporting while well, Rupert Harrison and New Shekelian are still here with me. Uh, New Shekelian, um, neither Liz Truss nor John McDonnell want to increase the size of the state, both agreeing that now 41% is fine. But th th do you see it inevitable? 
as the st- state increasing? Um, I do, because I think it's eventually going to cost the state more money, not not spending more money, if you see what I mean. When you have um, sort of 169% increase in rough sleeping on our streets, that's going to cost the NHS in the end. Um, so I do think it's inevitable. But there is a reason why John McDonnell is saying that he'd be spending no more than the national income than the government is, because he wants to look responsible. He wants to have this bank manager um, aura rather than being a sort of radical um, rabble rouser so that he can appeal to the middle classes. And that's the similar problem for the government because we, we're we still in an age of austerity, but middle class people have begun to notice. So they've seen homeless people on their streets. They've seen potholes ruining their bikes and their cars. And they've seen um, schools having a shortage of supplies for their children. And so the middle classes have noticed and so the government has to respond. Do you think that's right, Rupert Harrison, despite what Liz Truss was saying there, that the middle classes have noticed that then that actually the public have had enough? I think after eight years of austerity, there is um, there are going to be places that are under strain. I think the NHS recently is a great example. You know, you cannot have any increases in NHS funding for many, many years that go are significantly below the historic average. And so the government is recognising reality with recent announcement that it's going to increase back towards that average. And that also reflects the new economic reality. We had figures out this morning the deficit is 1.9% of GDP. It's not 10% of GDP anymore. It's not that burning, uh, you know, absolutely kind of vital risk to the economy that it used to be. So I think we're now in a more normal period. We're not, you know, it's going to feel like austerity in some areas because if you want to increase spending somewhere, you're going to have to continue to be tight somewhere else. But we're not in the kind of crisis period and nor are we in the period of plenty that we had in the run-up to the crisis. And yet there is still, Anusha Shekeli, and nobody's prepared to talk about tax rises, which a lot of people say that is the inevitable consequence of what comes next. Well, exactly. And I think this is a big problem for Theresa May and Philip Hammond, because it means that they're basically saying the argument for austerity is lost if they start talking about tax rises and increasing spending. And that's really difficult for them. Um, And, you know, we're not in the end of austerity yet. People always say that they are, but they aren't. Anusha Kellyan, Rupert Harrison, that's it from us. uh, PM is at five. That's the World at One's austerity special. Goodbye.